And thanks for Rock for setting this up. And hello to all my fellow members and sailing friends around the world, all of us land bound, unfortunately, at the moment. But hopefully this can uh, entertain you for one hour of our lockdown. Yeah, good job. Let's go break a record. Yes, come on. It's uh, very exciting to be back. So this is my sixth attempt to sail around the world non-stop. So I want this to be the fastest trip ever. Ça c'est l'Australie, ça c'est le Cap Lewin, et nous venons de passer le Cap Lewin. Donc Juan en 17 jours, 23 heures et 57 minutes. C'est pas mal, c'est pas mal. That is just a, a most amazing bit of bit of footage. Uh, average speed over twenty six knots. What was it like on board? Oh, it was it was uh, fast and furious. Oh, actually, our motto was fast but not furious. <laughs> just trying to keep the boat just the hull not quite flying. Uh, try to keep a keep a sort of ninety five percent speed the whole way. Um, so downwind, you'd be doing 37 knots. That was just your average. Uh, Lloyd Thornburg's Fado records in the Rourke Transatlantic race, Rourke Caribbean 600, Rolex middle. I, I, I could go on. Let's let's just uh, show a little bit of. Uh, uh, this is the start of the Rourke Transatlantic race 2015, and there's no so, uh, there's no commentary, Brian. So you you feel free to go ahead. Fado, Royal Transatlantic Race 2015. Oh, yeah, this will be the start in Puerto, um, Marina Lanzarote and then jiving into Puerto Calero. Yeah, Jenica and Chip, there we are. It gets a bit lighter there, but we're soon off and going fast across uh, down towards uh, Gran Canaria and then into here we are in uh, mid-Atlantic. Who's that? Is that that's, that's Henry Bombay. Having a bit of, a, a, bit of a dance. <laughs> he's warming up. He's keeping his legs uh, legs fit. For the... <laughs> <laughs> that's, do, that's doing uh, probably 30 knots there. 30-knot wow. karate kick. That's Sam Goodchild there. 
driving. Yeah. Uh, 27, that would be like a low speed downwind. Wow. That's a, you're often trying to do 30 knots. That was your target speed downwind. Wow. That's say one, one, 135 to 142 true wind angle. Very good VMG. That's that's me. Okay. You can see some land in the back. And here we are just coming into Grenada. I think the wind suddenly died. And uh, we've gone now to full sail, beating up to the finish in St. George's. And, uh, yeah, great crew of, of six. And we had uh, cool. um, a super race against the size on that, on yeah. that event. Yes. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Like the bomb. Lovely. We need to work on our timing there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that picture. I I might have been already uh, taken off by helicopter when that one was taken. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah, that was the famous drum capsize off uh, Cornwall. Yeah, in very the, well in known. The eighty-five too. fast net. Eighty-five fast net. About uh, five six weeks before the start of the round, the world race, we were upside down. Um, yeah. And uh, well documented uh, keel failure, and uh, yeah, and we managed to, you know, the story is everybody, you know, knows the story. We managed to pull it all together with support from Simon Laban uh, and Mike and Paul Barrow, and uh, more money was spent. Obviously, all the stops pulled out, and we managed to get to the start and complete the around the world race with a few hiccups in between, but. Had an outstanding, outstanding bunch of seamen and sailors. Uh, it was a crack crew and, uh, you know, cr great experience. Simon Le Bon and the drum brought up a whole new dimension to the race. Here was a pop star, a well-known name right across the world uh, coming in doing the race. I thought it was a high-risk situation in the beginning when I first heard about it, especially when I met Simon for the first time. His uh, rock star get-up, but it all transpired to be very enjoyable indeed. He was a very uh, intellectual sort of guy, and when he was with the crew on the sailboat, he really was a different person, I think, and I think he really enjoyed that a lot. Sam Davies, Vendée Globe star, Volvo Ocean Race skipper, and right now also looking after two eight-year-olds at home who have just come out of the shower. Is that right, Sam? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I hope there's not going to be, I hope there's not going to be too many strange interruptions uh, during the interview. Because uh, Roman's gone out kite surfing because it's perfect foiling conditions and has abandoned me with two crazy children. Although it's something, and until then I hadn't felt ready to go and do a Vendée because people had had tried to kind of say before, oh you should do the Vendée Globe and. And I was like, well, yeah, I could sail around the world, but I wouldn't do it justice. And I wanted to get to a level where I knew that I'd be able to go and be proud of myself and, and have fun and not be scared. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, and so I had to have that level of experience. And I think Roxy kind of called me just about at the right time when I, I knew that I'd be able to. Uh, and I had time to train and, and, um, and get the right people around me to prepare the race. And uh, so, yeah, I was very lucky there. Um, and then. Obviously, the next the next one day after that was a lot harder. Mm -hmm. cause, um, it was I was looking for money after 2009 when um, the the world well the world was in a bit more of financial difficulties and it was really hard to find the sponsorship and um, and I spent two and a half years uh, trying to raise the money and mm -hmm. um, uh, okay uh, with a lot of help from from a lot of people. Well, come on, Sam, let's have a look at some action. <laughs> it's an amazing race. And um, I think you see in the first uh, in the first pictures here um, all the crowds. I think probably a lot of people who are watching right now, you've seen that um, either from being there or for, from uh, seeing the videos. And it's just absolutely incredible. The the atmosphere at the start mm -hmm. when you leave uh, Les Sables alone. These people, are, they... they they get up at four in the morning to be sure they get a front row on the yeah. um, on in the entrance channel, um, and they're there with their breakfast picnics. It's, and and it's November; it's just crazy. And, and you look super confident. I've got to say, there you look super confident at the start. Well, that's what I was saying. I I I would never even dare to go if I 
if I didn't think I'd like fully prepared it because I want to go out there and, and like not be shit scared and, and enjoy it because it's an amazing opportunity. And so Mm -hmm. for me, that means putting in the hours and doing the training and, and the preparation and learning my boat inside out. And, um, I kind of need that confidence when I get to the Mm Les Abdelon because it's, yeah, for me, it's part of the, it's part of the deal. And, um, yeah, it's the same right now with Initiative Co. Is I'm, I'm working really hard to have that same feeling when I get to the start line in November. Okay, okay. And, yeah, these, well, so these are, the, some of this is the helicopter uh, pre-race images, but all these shots are ones I filmed on yeah. during the race. And, um, yeah. And this, I think this one got used quite a lot. And the Christmas one and the kids, the kids love it because I think I swear in the Christmas video. Right, I'm, just gonna, it, I'm just going to go back to that Christmas one because you, I mean, it was, I'm sure it was like, you know, on the main news all this, you, you, you became a massive superstar and it, and it wasn't just the amazing uh, thing that you were doing. It was your attitude. It, 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 it was just incredible. You know, it, 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 it was like you brought the mini transat into an Amoka 60 for me. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I I kind of just realised how lucky I am to have this opportunity, and and I just want to try and and share it with as many people as possible because I know there's a lot of people out there who would who would love to do it too, or who who would have loved to, or for whatever reason, um, can't or or isn't aren't there, and um and so yeah. I'm kind of doing it, and and I know in France a lot of kids follow it at schools and and i was thinking you know if this helps the teachers and helps the kids want to go to school because they're learning about the Vendée globe then i'm i'm really happy to send back some some images so when i was filming i was kind of just trying to do it for for the people i knew would be enjoying enjoy to follow okay. it and uh, and and maybe make a few more people want to to learn to sail or to go out sailing early days <laughs> You just try to embarrass me, Louis. <laughs> so th- this was the advent of sponsorship, Louis, the As plumber's <laughs> mate, because my, my, my dad owned a plumber's merchant, and of course he managed to put the boat through the business. So hence the plumber's oh. mate. And um, yeah, that, I had that boat from you, and, and uh, actually love, love that photo because the very unhappy looking child uh, stood next to me on the right of the picture was my French school exchange partner. <laughs> who'd come over from France, aged, I think, about 12 or 13, who couldn't sail. He came over to learn English. And I said, "Uh, I need to do a mirror open meeting. You're going to have to come and crew for me. Yeah, amazing, you know, to go into the Australian's backyard and scoop those medals. um, Just, yeah, under the the opera house. That's, you know, the medal ceremony on the steps of the opera house under the Sydney Harbour Bridge. With your family there, uh, you, you can't beat it. We, we dominated this race, whether it was the media award, the import mm. race, the offshore, everything just came together and it all, it all went right. Chase is cyclone fan in the tail end of it here. Trying to elude the high pressure that's going to build behind, and uh, if we can get around the front of the high, that means we can then reach down south. Racing is awesome. We've got Alba Medica just here. We're ripping into the back of them. Very exciting. This man once told me, get a good start, get in front of everybody, and then cover. It's the easiest way to win a sailing race. I've been a teacher in Harrogate now for 16 years, and I've seen Outdoor Pursuits do some incredible things. It provides all students with access to experiences which otherwise they may not be able to do. In extreme cases, it's drawn some students to some of the most prestigious universities in the UK, and on the other hand, kept some students free of crime and antisocial behaviour. Well, this week's guest is not a professional sailor, and he's not won any world championships, but John Holt and the Scaramouche Sailing Trust have won the heart and the support of the sailing community. John joins us from the classroom of the Greg City Academy in North London. John... A warm welcome to the show. 
Thank you very much, Lorraine. And hello to everyone at, at Rourke. We hope to share some of our story with you this evening and then uh, see if we can uh, sort of maybe give some advice about youth sailing, possibly. My friends weren't too sure about it because um, no one from like London or Tottenham or who we knew of has done sailing before. So the people who did do sailing were a bit uh, confused about what it was about. And it tells my parents, my mom was a bit skeptical about it because um, I showed her a couple of videos and she did her own research into the like the past that race and then she saw um, like some of the tragic ones and she was a bit skeptical um, skeptical about it. So, but when she saw like the benefits that came out of it and how how much I enjoyed it, she was really supportive and became my number one supporter and the project's number one supporter. And then, um, yeah, it just kept on. Everybody else kept on. Um, back in me and this project after that. How has sailing changed your life? Um, it's changed my life in many different ways. In terms of me, in terms of my personality, it's made me, I think, more confident and more likely to like push myself to do things that I wouldn't do in, in the past. So I think in terms of that and open up opportunities, of course, it's changed my life in so many different ways. Uh, some some I can't even imagine that. In terms of, well, as I said, it's made me get to uni unconditionally and open up the doors in terms of sailing and boats that I've got onto. I know the, the, the only important picture is uh, the first boat around the rocks. Uh, just as if you are there, you miss the boat just for, for, for 10 minutes of storm. Uh, wow. yeah. but, lucky. but the weather broke and and you know i mean look at the, that the, the, the incredible incredible <laughs> half an hour of picture look at this one the follow one is incredible this was just a uh, before it was uh, impossible to fly we don't see nothing and the risk was to miss to miss uh, the boat yeah. uh, to to the rocks uh, in the end look at I was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Do you get fantastic light at that, you know, at that moment? Look at that. That must fill your heart when you see that light. Yeah, yeah. This is a... Uh, we look for these things. Go to the limit all the time. A home Olympic Games... That is a once... That's a once in a lifetime. It's not even once in a lifetime. That isn't. I mean, it, you know, the Olympic Games will not be in London again in my lifetime. Put it that way. You know, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be sailing off to Valhalla before it's back. In. So, so, so. I mean, that is all the planets aligning, isn't it, for, for you? What do you say? I mean, it's just there's so it's the stars align. Yeah, planets aligning. I can't. It, it's almost. It, I'm so lucky that I am this age, and I was at that point in my career you know and 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 i'm sure the fact that it was a home games gave an extra ounce of oomph and passion to the whole cause and you know and i, I just it's it's so so fortunate i can, can never quite get the words out as to what it meant to be that age and to be at home games it's just everything that would have been a, do you know what that would have been enough for me yeah. if that's all it ever was it would have it would have been. I mean, it's not enough, and I'm desperate to go and win. But, but the reality is, I look back now, and a few years have passed. To have, you know, my dad push me into a wee oppie, um yeah. before that, and to to have access to that um, level of commitment that him and mum gave me to travel me up and down the country in those early days in oppies, yeah. and just get into a position where I, it, it it could be a goal rather than a dream. Um, Wow, lucky, lucky boy. Elliot and I had a really good couple of years together in the class, and we were we were all charging for Rio and uh, regularly on the podium. And I think it was November when Elliot really started to not feel well, and went through a series of tests of all sorts, and yeah, and, and diagnosed with bowel cancer. I mean, it's it's. It's not fair, it's tragic, isn't it? It's a young, fit guy. Um, and uh, it just, uh, the world's cruel sometimes, isn't it? 
I, I still don't even know what I think of it now because it's, I just, more than anything else, I hope that he recovers more than anything else, you know? Um, and, in, and in the same breath, I, I hope that whatever I go to do in Rio with Chris, Elliot was, is part of that. He was part of that. We're finishing things that Ellie and I started together. I reckon you'd like this photograph, so come on. <laughs> well, a lot of fresh key, air yeah. in between first and second there, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, this is, this is race five in Rio, and we're inside uh, Guanabara Bay, you know, in the, inside the heads of the whole thing. And, yeah, we, this, was, this was a sunset race. We waited all day for wind. Uh, uh, as as we often did in Rio, and okay. um, and the tide was so strong, like you really needed a good bit of pressure to even race against the tide often. And uh, we'd waited till so I think this was a four o'clock, and the sun sets about half five, you know. So the, the race committee are squeezing us in, and Twiggy and I were just so pumped all day, and we were right. quite quite willing to wait. We'll wait as long as it takes, and we. Yeah, this is this was a this was a right hand track. I remember so well, and it was a big tidal choice because there was relief from the adverse current, left and right. And uh, through all our notes and and through our work that we'd done previously, we, the right was always a bit safer. Okay. Um, and Sugarloaf Mountain produced a bit of a converging effect in the breeze as well. So I remember we um, we committed. We came off the line and said it's one or the other, you know. And and the fleet were doing the same, and we made a real commitment to get onto port first and get out to the right. And um, we'd had about nine caffeine chewing gums each at this stage, so we were ready for it. And Twiggy, the absolute warrior, never stopped pumping in this race. Yeah. He never stopped pumping, and we he ended himself. We knew it was only going to be one race, and he buried himself in the pain cave, which enabled me to get the lanes I needed and choose what we need to do tactically. And, yeah... A big, a big race win. It was nice. Yeah, it was it nice. Is. Introduction. Uh, Alexis Loison shot to fame, winning the 2013 Rolex Fastnet race overall with his father on night and day. Pascal and Alexis became the first and only two-handed team to lift the Fastnet Challenge Cup in the 95 year history of the race. It's not until the morning of day five that the winners finally emerge when Pascal and Alexis Loison, yeah, a father and son team from Cherbourg, sail their 33 day, foot night and day towards the finish line. Uh, They've sailed a brilliant yeah, yeah. But the boat was uh, uh, imagine uh, for uh, win this race. So it's a very uh, Good uh, happening. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> a very win. good happening. I'll, I'll I'll leave it there for now. So you are literally just crossing the line there, but uh, these are some lovely words from your father after yes. uh, on the dockside in French. <laughs> <laughs> Effectivement, en double, depuis quelques années, la, la, un peu les, les courses en solitaire que toi tu fais beaucoup ont permis aux équipages réduits d'être aussi performants que les équipages complets. Mais on, nous, on n'en est pas plus surpris que ça. And Pascal and Alexis Loison received the Fastnet Challenge Cup for their outstanding performance overall. For many sailors, their victory will serve as a happy reminder that one of offshore racing's greatest challenges can still be tackled and won by the crews of its smallest boats. So come on, Alexi, who has the Rolex watch? Is it you or your father? No, my my father keeps the the watch because uh, night and day is a. Uh, both of my father, okay, and I have uh, plenty of time to to win another one. Ah, okay. Maybe, <laughs> maybe with the uh, next fastnet. Uh... <laughs> well, I...
2013, you were Rookie of the Year. No Brit had ever done that. That's that's incredible to go and do your first Figaro and get uh, right up there, wasn't it? Yeah, it was fantastic. It was, uh, you know, for me since, uh, you know, nearly since always my and still is my my objectives to do the Vendée Globe, and uh, you know this was sort of my first chance to have a go at uh, solo racing effectively, mm-hmm. and you know that that first year with with Artemis was fantastic. I think you know it was some of the best memories of my life. It was just something I've been working towards for so long, and finally had a chance to do it and. Just gave it everything, I think. I love this clip, and thank you very much to the Ocean Race for, for letting us have this. And again, this has got no sound, Jack, and I'm pretty sure you're on the helm. This is in the Southern Ocean in the 2017-18 uh, Volvo Ocean Race. So um, just talk us through this, Jack. What sort of speed are you doing there? Uh, yeah, probably, I don't know, between 23 and... 28 knots, I guess, touching 30 at times. Uh, but this sort of would have been maybe a week into the leg from New Zealand to Brazil. And that was a very tough leg. Uh, mm. Very cold, very, very windy. I think we had basically nine, I think it was 11 days from the start to Cape Horn. And, you know, 10 of the days we had an average wind speed of 30 knots or something. Like it was just super windy all the time. And obviously uh, had some very hairy moments. Uh, what a nail biter! I mean, the closest race in the history of the race. You know, been going forty years. Um, I'm going to ask you a question here, and I hope you will answer it. So, coming into the finish, there we had a lot of exclusion zones. You know, the the sandbanks and what have you uh, uh, around the uh, the uh, the Schwabeningen coast, and you took a different route to the other two. You went you went hugging the Dutch coastline. Why? <laughs> uh, we'd actually looked into that option a lot before the leg. Uh, on on shore, where the route of Marcel Ventris basically uh, effectively came up with that option and gave us that option uh, uh, before the start, saying we had obviously conditions that it had to be, and we had to the timing had to be, be right and everything. And uh, obviously, he said at the beginning. Um, we would take a loss because we were sailing more distance effectively. The other, you know, going offshore was a straight line. Um, but basically the last leg, um, when the boats offshore had to go around a buoy and come due south, mm. uh, we were on a much better angle and yeah. normally more pressure on the shore. Yeah. And But it was really that, uh, you know, you have to put all your cards on the table and it'll <laughs> only come good in the last, you know, five minutes, basically. Yeah. You know, you start to get a feeling in the helicopter Yeah, obviously you cross the line and, you know, I think two years of, you know, the whole yeah. about two years and two Ooh. years worth of stress and pain and everything, it's just you just instantly, instantly, I guess, and, uh, you know, that was a pretty amazing feeling, and, uh, you know, I think everyone, everyone just broke down, everyone was crying, and that was, you know, it was just such a big, such a big moment. that but in in this condition you don't have the right to be uh, to be to be poor or sad you you for yeah. sure you are very happy you know this uh, this evening um uh, i uh i had to, to, to I, I don't know how do you say that in english but i had to carry everybody to sleep because i didn't want to sleep <laughs> uh what a, i mean what an what a, what an amazing adventure to start as you put it with the white piece of paper and you know finishing the the Vendée Globe in 2001 doing everything everything meticulously and then having the problem and then coming back and beating the best fleet probably probably the race of the century of um Fado cubed in the Royal Caribbean 600 the 2015 and the reason we're showing it is because Michel was on board. So we'll catch up with Michel in a minute. Yeah, Enjoy- because yeah. because this number three boat uh, was uh, Foncia at the beginning. Ah, that That's- was your boat? Yeah, yeah. Oh, anyway. yeah, I didn't yeah. know that. I, yeah. Well, I probably should have known that. And, uh, and it's uh, someone, it's the first of uh, Time Over Distance uh, speaker who, who called me 
Uh, I know you have a, a Mod 70 for sale. Uh, I have yeah. someone to buy it. Uh, and it's Brian Thompson who, who called me. Okay, okay. Yeah. Let's, we'll watch the movie and then you can tell us about your first trip to Antigua. Let the first time I went in Antigua, I met you. That's a disaster for me to do. Oh. <laughs> Shh, don't tell anyone. Shh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is when you cross the just after finish cross the finish line and go back to the arbor. If you had one shot. You want to talk to this, Michelle? I can turn the movie down. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no. Um, those boats were very, very simple to to drive and very uh, reliable, very. Um, and it was a pleasure to to help uh, Brian to make this boat fast fast again. Uh, with uh, Lloyd uh, Thornburg, which was uh, a very um, kind uh, owner. He was the, the, the owner of Fado uh, 2, which was, which was, a, 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 which is, which was a Gunboat 66, and, and uh, the, the, for sure the step from Gunboat 66, which is not already a, a slow boat, but already a fast boat, uh, to a Mod 70 was a big, a big step for him, but um, that was fun um, after the first uh, the, the round on Tigua. Uh, how you, you came back the how, next year? Louis, Louis, <laughs> how can you not love this race? Tell me. Uh, that's impossible. You you sail in the, in one of the best place, or maybe the best place for big boats in in uh, in West Indies. Yeah, you yeah. sail in hot water in nice islands around nice islands, and here I was with nice boats. Uh, because the, the year after I was sailing with uh, Tim Concise, uh, yeah. another Mod 70. Um, Tony uh, Lawson's boat. Yeah, yes. uh, with a very good, uh, very good uh, crew. Uh, they were young, but they, they were yeah. al already very good. Um, and it was it was beautiful to sail there and to make this Caribbean six, 602 time. And I yeah. and I think that Alex is very close to win the next Vendée Globe, for sure. Okay. And it's okay. not because I'm, not, I'm with the UK media. That's... <laughs> you, you can just say the truth. It's it's fine by me. I, I always say what I think. Never <laughs> never different. Well, Michelle... Oh, what is this place? We don't know this place. <laughs> There's a lot of support and enablement for you to go down there, but you still got to deal with it yourself. And so I think that whole, like, yeah, here's your weather forecast. I'm really sorry. <laughs> and I still just have to deal with it. And and there was one uh, terrifying trip up the rig. Can you just tell us about that? Oh, well, I'm not good with heights anyway. And I had been practicing and you kind of pick your moment. So I'd gone up in the Atlantic before I'd even entered the Southern Ocean. You do your checks because it's preventative more than anything else. But in the Southern Ocean, we'd had a really bad storm a big electrical storm and the lightning had hit the top of the rig. I guess nothing else down there, I attracted it. But of course, at the top of the rig's your wind instruments and the little PC board at the top there um, had fried. And without that information, your autopilot struggle even more than mine already were. So I knew I had to go up and, and change it. And so you kind of pick the best window possible but it's all relative to what you've been in. So if you've been crashing around in 50 knots, when you see 30 knots, you go, oh, yeah, this is quite nice. And I went up, um, probably not at the right time, especially because I'm quite nervous anyway, and my koala impression's quite good. <laughs> I get halfway up the rig, and you do that whole, this is ridiculous, you look, oh. look down, and there's nobody on the boat there. And you see a wall of cloud coming in towards you, and the light's falling, and you're like, I've got to get this done. And you put the pressure on. And I don't know whether I froze or my equipment froze, but anything. Anyway, we all got stuck. I didn't go up. I couldn't come down. I couldn't do anything. And you immediately obviously want to cry and realize that that's not going to help you either. So I kind of did that whole, right, what am I going to do? And it took me about 90 minutes, an hour and a half to kind of get the, the confidence I needed to kind of disconnect myself and get myself down. 
and then kind of sort out the mess. And I was a bit battered and bruised, realised then that I also had to call home to reassure them that I was back down on deck and all okay. But then, of course, the realisation was I still hadn't done the job that I needed to do, so I was still going to have to go up there again at some point. But I did wait until much better conditions. But, it, yeah, those kind of things kind of knock your confidence a little bit. But then you kind of think, well, I survived. I could do it again. So, uh, so you can't knock your confidence and then build yourself back up again. <laughs> incredible story, Dee. Incredible story. Well, um, here's a, a screenshot of a video we're just about to play. And this is Dee arriving back in Southampton, having sailed around the world the wrong way solo, nonstop. Um, let's play you uh, that video. Uh, there's a little bit of commentary, D, but your mic's live, so if you want to say something, we'd be really, uh, we'd be really happy to hear it. Okay. Uh, Aviva Challenge, arriving in Southampton. Here we go. There's a lot of support and enablement for you to go down there, but you still got to deal with it yourself. And so I think that whole like, yeah, here's your weather forecast. I'm really sorry, <laughs> and I still just have to deal with it. And, and there was one uh, a terrifying trip up the rig. Can you just tell us about that? Oh, well, I'm not good with heights anyway. And I had been practicing and you kind of pick your moment. So I'd gone up in the Atlantic before I'd even entered the Southern Ocean. You do your checks because it's preventative more than anything else. But in the Southern Ocean, we'd had a really bad storm, a big electrical storm and the light had hit the top of the rig I guess nothing else down there I attracted it but of course at the top of the rigs your wind instruments and the little PC board at the top there um, had fried and without that information your autopilot struggle even more than mine already were so I knew I had to go up and, and change it and so you kind of pick the best window possible but it's all relative to what you've been in. So if you've been crashing around in 50 knots, when you see 30 knots, you go, oh, yeah, this is quite nice. And I went up, um, probably not at the right time, especially because I'm quite nervous anyway, and my koala impression's quite good. <laughs> I get halfway up the rig, and you do that whole, this is ridiculous, you look, oh. look down, and there's nobody on the boat there. And you see a wall of cloud coming in towards you, and the light's falling, and you're like, I've got to get this done. And you put the pressure on. And I don't know whether I froze or my equipment froze, but anything. Anyway, we all got stuck. I didn't go up. I couldn't come down. I couldn't do anything. And you immediately obviously want to cry and realize that that's not going to help you either. So I kind of did that whole, right, what am I going to do? And it took me about 90 minutes, an hour and a half to kind of get the, the confidence that I needed to kind of disconnect myself and get myself down and then kind of sort out the mess. And I was a bit battered and bruised, realized then that I also had to call home to reassure them that I was back down on deck and all okay. But then of course the realization was I still hadn't done the job that I needed to do. So I was still gonna to have to go up there again at some point, but I did wait until much better conditions. But it, yeah, those kind of things kind of knock your confidence a little bit, but then you kind of think, wow, I survived, I could do it again. So. Uh, so you can't knock your confidence and then build yourself back up again. <laughs> incredible story, D. Incredible story. Well, um, here's a, a screenshot of a video we're just about to play. And this is D arriving back in Southampton, having sailed around the world the wrong way solo, nonstop. Um, let's play you uh, that video. Uh, there's a little bit of commentary, D, but your mic's live. So if you want to say something, we'd be really, uh, we'd be really happy to hear it. Okay. Uh, Aviva Challenge, arriving in Southampton. Here we go. I recognise that, Dee. Yeah, familiar landmark. That was really nice to see. But I, what I can believe, I mean, it was miserable weather. I think it was torrential rain. It was May as well, so, you know, the UK really put the weather on for me. But I couldn't believe the volume of people on a miserable day that had come out on the water to see me in. Look at that. And that was one thing. But, yeah, the crowds <laughs> were the unbelievable bit. And I thought the rain would kind of disguise any tears I had. But, Luckily, yeah, they were happy tears That's for sure. For and then you get that kind of embarrassment because you've just been on your own all that time and then suddenly everybody's looking at everything you do and say... I think my mum was very relieved to have me home then. Oh, but that's your mum there, yeah? 
Yeah. She did that whole, I'm very proud of you, thank God you're home kind of thing. Oh, incredible. And, and you know, it, it was. I was there. I, I, I can remember it. And it was incredible watching you come in uh, to Southampton and, and uh, to that the huge crowd, the ticker tape parade and, you know, and everything else. It was, uh, it must have been incredible for you having been on your own for 178 days to, to come back to a big crowd like that. Yeah, I think a little bit, as I said, it was a bit embarrassing. I kind of thought, oh, God, you know, and I felt really self-conscious. And then you're kind of fueled by adrenaline. And I had six months of, like, activity to tell everybody about. And I just had verbal diarrhea, I think. <laughs> I mean, I remember the guys when they stepped on board the boat to, like, kind of bring the boat in with me. They were taking it like a watch system just to listen to me because I literally yeah. didn't stop. <laughs> and I wasn't really in need of sleep because I used to just cat nap. So oh. I was just like on full download to everybody. And I remember I went from the arrival, Princess Anne was there. And then I went into a press conference that was kind of streamed live to lots of stations. But I didn't really realize it at the moment. And literally I'd interrupted loads of people's news to come live to this press conference. And I was there chatting away, completely unaware of the fact that it was being broadcast out there. But I guess that's what made it quite genuine, really. And and D, I, I, I'd like to uh, I'd like to know what what did you learn, not as a not as a person from from the Aviva Challenge. What did you learn about yourself? Oh, that I was an emotional mess. The Aviva Challenge was quite funny because I had no. I kind of focus on the physical action of sailing a boat on my own of like, Oh, how am I going to do this? I had completely underestimated the whole kind of um, psychological side of it and the roller coaster I was going to go on. And I mean, from this, I finished in 2006 and I lined up um, on 2008 for the Vendee Globe. And my biggest transition on that, was the psychological preparation. And that was just stepping me from this adventurer that knew nothing about what she was doing to actually becoming more professional. And that was about learning how to manage myself and my emotions and not waste the extra energy, make mm -hmm. sure all my energy is focusing on making the boat go fast in the right direction. And it saved that whole kind of tearful moment and then um, kind of happy moments and all these emotions that I wasn't in control of. Yeah. and little things the way food and hydration and sleep affect you and stuff like that so I, I kind of had underestimated that side of an athlete completely what what was it like you know being an apprentice at green marine uh, well it, it was it was wonderful i mean i was lucky to to you know to be in i went around i remember getting on my bike and cycling around to um undershore road then which was the little factory green marine started off in and I think there were five people working at Green Marine and, you know, Bill and Bill mixed the resin and Ian made sure everything went on, the material went on properly. And um, I bowled up, saw Bill and said, you know, I'm looking for an apprenticeship. And Bill said, oh, we don't want to give you an apprenticeship, you know, ah, <laughs> just come and have a job. <laughs> but um, anyway, it, I managed to persuade them. And um, again, they took me under their wing and it was it was brilliant, you know, because I was at, at that time, you know, these boats were really pioneering in the, in the boat building mm. sense, you know, they were, there was McConaughey's doing it and, you know, Green Marine Cooks and a few of these yards that were still quite new and carbon boats or pre-preg boats were certainly very new. And I think we did the first pre-preg hull, which I think was promotion in the 50 footer in those oh. days. Um, so I, I sort of, you know, was right there when it was all happening. So it was, it was wonderful. I was very lucky. And, and again, met lots of, lots of people and Bill and Ian, you know, let me do my sailing and, and in many ways helped me. Yeah. One thing that I it always bugs me a little bit is, you know, a lot of, a lot of credit was given to EF for, um, amongst other things, the Code Zero. And certainly EF certainly deserved a lot of credit. It was a wonderful campaign and they were by far the class act in that race. But um, the actual, the, the, the first Code Zero I ever remember with hoisting, which was would have been on interim, was was called. Uh, it came, I remember Magnus coming marching down the dock with it under his arm, and it and it had lorry sail written on it. So it was something that Laurie had thought of this sort of tight luft headsail, and then we we started developing it in the early days before um, Paul and the guys arrived. And then we had then it was called uh, the Marley, which was masthead asymmetric laminate one, 
Um, so it was, a, yeah, it was a very interesting time. And we we had the first halyard lock on the rigs. We knew we had to get te- luff tension. In those days, we used to have to, you know, you hoist the sail and we had to go up the rig, strop it off. It was pretty pretty unpleasant. Um, so it was definitely a, a pioneering boat with lots of good stuff. Roger Scammell was involved in that halyard lock. It was it was good to be involved in, but certainly for the race, we just, you know, we weren't really there. EF did a much better job at developing the whole sail package and just took it took it to another level, really. Uh, Hugo Boss Six, which was built at Green Marine, and then yeah. uh, and then then this one, Hugo Boss yeah. HB Seven, as we call it. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, this is the bow of the boat. Uh, you know, it's not fair to call it Rad S. It's a totally different designer. But talking of different designers, VPLP. Um, in our chat, you call them Le Grand Fromage. <laughs> yeah, I'll get, no, I'll get in trouble for that, but that's what we call Vincent. <laughs> what, what's it? What's it been like working with 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 the designers of of twenty winning Route de Rum boats? Yeah, it was it was one. It was a great opportunity for us, um, and it was wonderful. And we got we have a the project manager for up for up working with with um, Carrington Boats here. Tara is French, and she was great mates with. Um, Danny, who's a big part of VPLP and uh, Quentin, so it was very, it was quite a social gathering. They they came quite, they probably came more than they needed to, <laughs> to have okay. to have lunch and a few beers. But it was a it was a great experience. The whole the whole thing was fun, and the boat was, you know, with, with Alex and and that sponsor, you know, you get to do something pretty special. You can't really tell there, but the whole boat is lacquered, clear carbon, everything, the bow sprit, the whole thing, all the way around. Um, so she she was a beautiful boat, and just a really fun project and and the team you know um mm. alex's team played a big part in that uh, pete hobson and, and of course guru the engineers structural engineers so it was a it, yeah it was a, a great sort of team effort i would say mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and we, we'd love to work with those guys again for sure that was r- really fun and they they as i say they came um we'd always put the french flag out when they'd come and uh, okay. <laughs> we had a lot of fun with them okay yeah. and and obviously going on to uh, to great things this year but you know, look at this. I mean, this is a piece of art, Jason, isn't it? Yeah, she's she's. I mean, it was funny. It's not unlike Ran, is it? It's, and I I know the the VPLP guys did joke that they'd seen Ran and kind of <laughs> took that bevel a bit from Ran. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. yeah, it was it was almost you know pushed even further. And they, I like that about um, Alex. You know, he he goes he, he has an idea and he goes for it. And I you know I like that the coach trip was all you know everything was. It all looks right. Um, it make, makes it fun, you know. It's it's cool, and then you can suggest stuff. They're open-minded. It's good, really good. And as we went into the faucet, we were leading. Now, there was a, a little uh, joke going around cows. The good news is the Irish team are leading the Admiral's Cup. The bad news is they've started to celebrate. But we were, in fact, very serious about winning it. And we were very optimistic. We were very excited by it. Um, as we headed down the channel in that race, on Golden Apple, we headed out to the middle of the channel, which was not the normal route. But we looked at the numbers, looked at everything else. And I was very comfortable going out there. I had almost been sent to Coventry by the crew until out of the mist off the Lizard, we dipped the 50-footer. We were 43. And the 50-footer Blizzard, one of the best boats in in the Admiral's Cup, we were up with her, rounding the corner. Then we headed out into the Irish Sea, and uh, or at the St. George's Channel, really, and and into the approaches. And the conditions began to change. It was an oily swell. The afternoon, as we headed into the, towards the fastness, was very murky. 
it was overcast, the barometer was dropping at about three millibars an hour, and we knew we were in for a hell of a beating. So in fact, towards the early afternoon, late evening, uh, early evening, late afternoon, we had what we call the last supper, because we knew we weren't going to eat again for a long time. As we headed into nightfall, the, um, we, we had hauled a bit west, so it gave us a, a line into the fastness from uh, the south rather than a direct course. We, we had our tri-radial spinnaker and we kept it up till we broached a couple of times. We took it down and we approached the fastener rock around midnight, I think, or eight minutes past midnight. And I remember we cut the corner where I was a racing rounding, which in fact was pretty terrifying because the light from the fastener was throwing up the, the waves and everything else. And I looked at the dials, it was 52 knots across the deck as we rounded the fastest and headed back. Oh, yeah. Incredible, uh, Harold, you know, your your recollection of that. And and I know you had uh, Hugh, Hugh Coveney, obviously, on board, the owner of the boat. You had Rodney Patterson and um, yourself, you, you know, you were a young, you're a young man with a big responsibility with the with the tactics. And um, but in those days, there was only um, there was only VHF radio. You weren't aware of what was going on, uh, you know, in the entire race, were you, Harold? No, we weren't. And, I mean, as, as we head away from the fastnet, the conditions freshened. It was already, it was already pretty fresh. And then the, uh, the problem occurred for so many boats. Uh, an hour or two after around the fastnet, we were coming back. We knew we were leading the Admiral's Cup. We were driving hard. We were young. We were gung-ho. And uh, about two hours, the weather clocked. So about... Um, 30 degrees, something like that. And then anyone who's been out in bad conditions knows that the waves initially are quite steep. They're quite short. And then after a while, the waves lengthen out. So at that stage where they were building up, because the wind was, at this stage, was approaching 60 knots. As the uh, conditions built up, the wind clocked around and then it built up a, a, a different wave train. And when those waves met, it created a wall. And the small boats could not survive that wall. They were just overwhelmed. We were getting a hell of a beating on our 43 footer, and we were we were just holding on for dear life. And as uh, Ron Holland described at one stage, he he wanted to talk to us on deck. You know, we, we were working a watch system still because we needed this to keep ourselves somewhat fresh. And he said you would open the hatch momentarily between waves because the waves were sweeping the boat. And I remember switching to the storm jib at one stage, and I went on the deck. I said to the guys, OK, this is not one to tell you to do it. I'll go and do it myself with you because I've been out in bad conditions and some of the young, uh, younger crew members had not been. So we, we sailed through the night. I didn't know what was going on. Our navigators, um, uh, Philip Bowen and the, the owner, Hugh Coveney, were mm. listening to the VHF. But there wasn't much information coming through because this, most boats didn't carry VHF. And, and uh, we really didn't, weren't much aware of what was happening. So as the weather lightened the following morning, we weren't that far from the cities. Um, I called for a spinnaker up. The crew said, no way. I said, right, let's negotiate this. We'll have a boomed out jib they propose. We called for that. They're on deck and we lost our rudder. So that's one that got away, I'm afraid. Hey, Jamarella, Juno, Indulgence, the, the winning British team in 1989. First cup win for eight years. And... All of the boats were consistent, but Jamarella, 42 boat fleet, no worse than fourth in any race. That's an incredible performance. Yes, Alan Gray, again, as an owner, was, was very organised, put together a great programme, had a great crew around with Laurie and the others, and uh, they, they, they did a really perfect programme. Yes, and I believe that the, it, it was a far 50, but it was built in Limington, and a lot of the team actually built the boat. Is that correct, Harold? I don't know. I don't remember. Okay. That's, um, uh, Lou Varney told me that. Uh, then, then it's gospel. <laughs> well, that, 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 that almost, almost with serene, silky skills brings us to our second rogues gallery, which is the victorious Jamarella team. And, um, we'll, we'll give you one. There's Harold Cudmore. At the back there, your first Admiral's Cup win, Harold. What was that like? 
Yeah, that, it was very satisfying that the team won, for sure. But the way the way that the win happened was what really pleased me, because there was to create this team view, and I think uh, Juno was probably uh, the weakest boat that year, because indulgence is always going to be good. <clears throat> and what they did was they held their team place. They, they they made sure they supported the team, got good enough result to ensure the team under Mike McIntyre. Um, that that in in a way is the way to do it. A boat that doesn't have the blinding speed and everything else that the leading boats have, but hung in there, got the numbers right, and got a team result. Very impressed with them. New Zealand didn't compete for the America's Cup until 1987. When you were a kid, when you were growing up, we, did you have a fascination for the America's Cup? Well, I guess uh, growing up in New Zealand, especially you're, um, you know, you're surrounded by water, and so you're very close to the water. And I was very uh, fortunate because my father was, um, he was in the navy in the war and served on the Gambia, and then came back here and uh, was involved in mullet boat sailing in the Waitemata here, and also he was um, pretty handy on the tools, so he built me a little P class and introduced me to sailing, and so. I got to know most of the, my mates uh, through that whole uh, introduction to sailing and guys that I've sailed with over the years have been guys I've met when I was just a kid. So you always dreamed of the highest uh, sort of part of the sport and for us it was the America's Cup and it was a, at that stage it was a dream you know, for that until Michael Fay came along and actually put up a challenge and really uh, gave New Zealand a starting point that um, we had a chance to win. The America's Cup goes to New Zealand first time in the history of of the nation, right up there, you know, with New Zealand's well known for the All Blacks for the rugby. But it was as big as that, wasn't it, Brad? Oh yes, we were quite surprised of the impact that it had on New Zealand um, when we when we got back. You know, you can see that's the day that uh, we won. Let's just tied us tied up against the San Diego Yacht Club and. There's some champagne in the cup, but not much. The actual cup's a bit of a crappy piece of silverware because it doesn't. It's not. It's not hollow. It's just got a little lip in it. So you know. But that was probably enough to get Russell drunk and ready. So anyway, he had a. We had a sip out of it, and uh, the other footage of him carrying it down is actually we stole it from the uh, the, the priest priest briefing that night and took it back to the. Uh, our compound for the party, which was dangerous to say the least, and uh, you know all that sort of thing was a great time. You know, I mean Peter Blake was he couldn't speak at the press conference, so we had to help him out. And there was a you know there, there was a big moment. And then when we got back to New Zealand, obviously you know we could see the crowds, which New Zealand had gone through you know quite a few years of um, trying to rebuild you know under a bit of a Labour government so it was things weren't great and then this came along and there was a lot of money spent on the infrastructure downtown Auckland and made a big difference to uh, to Auckland and then I think to the, the psyche of, of New Zealand and you know things got better and better and certainly they've got a lot better down here. Bertarelli there uh, spraying the champagne the cup's heading to Europe for the first time ever in, in the 155-year history of the Cup, uh, Bertrelli, he must have been overjoyed. Oh, for sure. I know, he was over the moon. And, you know, it's... Uh, you know, we were very fortunate to uh, wind up, you know, having an association with a young guy like him that is very motivated and, and uh, keen to to do well and you know doesn't leave anything on the course he wants to uh, try his hardest to win but he's very particular about how we go about it and so we have to be you know as, as professional as we possibly can and business like you know he doesn't want to waste money and he doesn't you know he doesn't uh, see that as a great idea so uh, you know we learnt a lot like I said I learnt a, a hell of a lot from him and he was you know totally over the moon to have, uh, to have won on his first shot. Out. When I saw this, I'm not joking, 
I um, the hair was standing up on the back of my neck. Let's just uh, watch the finish of that uh, de- deciding race in the 2007 match. Kiwis are faster. Alinghi pushing hard. Won't be ahead at the top mark. It's all about positioning. Yellow flag. It's a yellow flag. Alinghi now have a problem. We can see the pole that's come off the the tank of Alinghi. There's chaos down towards the finish. the key areas that you've been talking about today. Thanks, Lou. I, yeah, uh, look, I think in summary, um, yeah, plan plan for the outcome that you're after. Um, and it's not necessarily result based, um, you know, it, it, it think a lot about the enjoyment and keep the plan realistic. Um, don't forget Rod's mathematics, you know, that planning is only 40%. The other 80% is in the execution and, um, and, always be working to keep the game simple, take the complication out of it. Glorious conditions with the sun shining in this picture postcard setting, John Bertrand nailed race eight with a bullet. He didn't even need to go out and race in the ninth. He'd won the event, the World Etchells Championship after 20 years of trying. We jumped aboard to chat to John and his crew. Conditions here were superb this week, so we're very fortunate. And I just, you know, to have a team like this, sailing you know on the boat it's it's just a joy you know just the, hardly anything is said on the boat it's so quiet and uh, serene with the tactics and so on and because we're trying to balance mother nature with all the boats around us and you know piece it all together piece, piece the jigsaw together so just to uh, race with a red hot crew like this is to me is is a, a real thrill